Dredef Healthcare Stories. Carol Gill and Larry Voss are being interviewed in the living room of their home in Darien, Illinois. Their interviews are presented in six parts. This interview is part five. The last time I was hospitalized, I would need suctioning for my trach uh, to get secretions removed to allow me to breathe easier. And I would push the call light and it would sometimes take 20 minutes for a nurse to answer this in an intensive care unit, two patients for every nurse. They would not answer it. And when Carol would be visiting, sometimes she'd go out to the desk to see, well, what's going on? And she'd say the nurses were sitting there writing notes with their backs to the alarm, not even looking at it. The only thing I can think is they it was such a pressure on them to finish this paperwork that they didn't have time to respond to what could have been, you know, a much more urgent matter. As his spouse, I have seen this happen in several intensive care units, in several hospitals now, and also on floors of hospitals outside the intensive care unit. In all of these places, I've just, for me, it's almost been like a marker of how bad things have gotten. I sit there sometimes and I actually look at the clock from the moment he rings his bell to the time that someone comes and checks on him. And it, the average is five to 20 minutes, not seconds, five to 20 minutes. It's been as long as a half hour. And I'm talking about facilities that know he is a trach user, he's on, he's connected to his ventilator, the balloon in his trach is inflated, meaning he is in a you know physically vulnerable situation where he has to get the secretion suction for him to have a clear airway. And that is their response time. If he had a clog, push his call light, and the response was five minutes, which is the best it's pretty much been, he would be dead if he were not breathing. Now you might say, well, and, and I've been told this, well, the monitors would show he's not breathing. I mean, the ventilator would alarm, and the oximetry, which measures oxygen in his blood, would show a dip in oxygen, and that alarm would go off as well. Well, I can tell you that I have been there in that situation. I've been there when the oximeter has fallen off his finger and it alarmed repeatedly for up to a half hour and no one even looked in the door and checked. I have been there when his ventilator alarmed and because it had um, low pressure, which is the same alarm it makes if it's disconnected, and it has alarmed for 20 minutes without anyone checking. I don't understand it. I mean, I wish I could tell you how, why that happens. I can only tell you that it's happened in two of the best teaching hospitals in this country. That if you say the name of these hospitals to any doctor across this country, they would say, oh yeah, premier place. But it happens all the time in those two places. How can response time to a call light in intensive care by a person who is connected to a ventilator. How can that be five to 20 minutes? What have we come to? And I mean, it's gotten to the point where I'm bad, based on past experiences, when I do get into that setting, I tell the nurses, I'm not gonna push my call light for a glass of water or to change the TV channel. I'm, I'm pushing my call light. It means I've got a problem and it could very likely mean I need suctioning, and it doesn't make any difference. It might make a difference with one nurse, but it's not the type of thing that gets given to the next nurse on the next shift. It's not given in report where they talk about, well, this patient is this, needs this, and this, because I check, and, I, and it's like every time the shift changes, I have to try and make it clear again. I might need suctioning. If I do, I'm going to push the alarm. Please come, because I'm not pushing it for minor issues or matters, and it seems to make no difference. I know. You know I, I've even had uh, people from the nurse's area there 
come and check when I push a call light and say, do you need something? And I'll go, oh, you need suctioning? I'll tell the nurse. They go back, 15 minutes later, the nurse may come to suction. So, and I've had experiences where I could, my airway was clogged and I could not breathe. It was impossible for me to breathe. And so, you know, this could be a, a serious situation. Oh, Larry has had crises like that. He had a few of them in a rehab hospital. The difference is the rehab hospitals understand disability so much better. They know how serious it is when an airway clogs. You would think an acute hospital would know that too, but they just can't seem to get it, at least in our experience. Here's the difference. In the rehab hospital, when Larry's alarm went off on his, on his vent, I think the average response time was 10 to 15 seconds. And anybody on the floor who was a health professional would stop, run to the room, and make sure he was okay, including the secretary of the nurse's station. She would get up and run just to make sure it, it was okay. Mm -hmm. And that was like being in heaven. You know, we could actually take exhale and and relax, but anytime he goes to an acute hospital, I dread it. We, we will almost do anything to keep him at home. We delay it and delay it right. because and, he's in danger. And try to get out of there as soon as possible. Yeah. And it's, it's mind boggling. Carol and I both have been, you know, in the disability community and, and advocating, you know, for ourselves as well as others for, you know, a long time. And we frequently say, well, if we go into these situations and face these problems and try to confront them and change things, and we have very little success, you know, I think pity the poor person who goes in there as a newly disabled person or as an elderly person with a disability that they acquired late in life and they're going in there with their family and the nurses and doctors are saying, oh, he's in good hands, she's in good hands, you have nothing to worry about they'll get the best treatment, you know, and those that family kills home, trusting that this is the situation, and, and you know, it very likely won't be that situation. So I think for people with disabilities, you know, uh, the hospital's going to be a very dangerous place. I'm glad that this project is letting us sort of sound some alarms, because we're not exaggerating. Things are bottoming out um, in a really serious way. Healthcare Stories, made possible with generous support from the Manuel D. and Rhoda Mayerson Foundation. Carol Gill and Larry Voss were interviewed at their home in Darien, Illinois, July 2011. For more information, visit the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund website, dreadf.org forward slash healthcare dash stories. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 Unported License.